time, I think maybe we should we should limit our questions uh, during the talks to a, to a minimal amount, unless it's really pressing and burning. Let's uh, let's save those all for the end. Uh, so our first speaker today is Amos Ori from Technion. He's going to be telling us about the internal structure of rotating black holes. And with that said, let's uh, let Amos take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me in the I was very glad to hear that. I think that internal black holes is a fascinating place, especially <coughs> spinning black holes. And I was very glad to, to hear that, that a group of people started to work here on this topic. It's very interesting for me to come and have discussion. So, okay. By the way, uh, what going on inside physically is there? There are many, there could be many aspects of your question. What I'm going to talk is about the classical problem of black hole interior, as long as everybody, everything is still macroscopic. And uh, so this is only classical, although at the end of the discussion, we should see that the semi classical aspect, and probably also quantum gravity aspect, probably should become the position that you can see. Okay, so this is a famous diagram <coughs> of, of a curved black hole, analytically extended curved black hole. It is a pure vacuum solution, and it is made of infinite sequence of such universes. Uh, there is a singularity, but this is a ring singularity, and uh, it is time-like. This is very different from Schwab. So by the way, I, let's assume that this is our universe, this is a event horizon. But then instead of having a spectral singularity like in Schwarzschild, we have an inner horizon, an open bridge to other future <coughs> universes. And I'm talking about care. I should say from the beginning that the rather north from space that diagram looks very similar and to almost all aspects I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about. It is just like care, but I'll focus on care if I think of it because it is vacuum. So this is a, a world line, a geodesic world line of a free falling observer, typical free falling observer, jumps in from the uh, external universe, crosses the, the event horizon, crosses the inner horizon, getting closer to the R equals zero singularity, but it doesn't get there. Instead, it bounces and make all the way back to another external universe. This is a fascinating property of the analytically extended geometry. <laughs> so for this observer, the black hole serves as a bridge from the original external universe to another external one. This was discovered in the 60s and quite amazing. However, now the question is, what is the relation between this uh, fantastic space and diagram and realistic spinning black holes? So we know that a spinning black hole, <coughs> after all the wave decay and so on, becomes stationary. Outside, it approaches scale. But does it mean that we have all this in the interior beyond the event horizon? So obviously there are several uh, ingredients here, or several aspects here which are not realistic. So let's mention. The first of all, this is an eternal black hole. And, uh, and but in reality, for astrophysical black hole, we expect to be we are used to think uh, about objects that fall in gravitational collapse, not eternal. So all these left part of the diagram should be somehow replaced by a collapsing object, which is in the moment. That's the first aspect that will be taken into account. The other one is that, okay, this is a event horizon, this is an inner horizon. This one actually is also a Cauchy horizon, which means that for any initial data prescribed in the external universe, evolution in, is unique mathematically evolution is unique up to this null line. 
beyond this, so in, in the curve solution, geometry is, is perfectly regular and per perfectly smooth analytic across it, but from the viewpoint of predictability of the, sol of the Cauchy problem of the evolution, the evolution up to the Cauchy horizon is unique. Beyond it, it's not unique. There are infinite number of possible extensions beyond the Cauchy horizon. This specific one mm -hmm. is the analytic extension, it's only one analytic extension. But if you only require a smooth extension, then it's not unique, so there are infinite number. The, la the, the other feature which we should need to take into account is the fact that this hypersurface, this line in curve, it is smooth, but it was shown uh, that once perturbations are added, it, be, it is unstable to addition of perturbation. I'll come to this in a moment. So let's start with, so, so now I'm going to focus on this region here. On, uh, this is a relevant region for our discussion. So here we do zoom on this region. Again, event horizon, mean horizon, Cauchy, which is also Cauchy horizon. And now, first of all, as we said, in reality, we assume that there is a collapsing star, collapsing spinning star. So this is a green, green uh, area represents a collapsing matter. Still, here it's presumably vacuum. So, in principle, we could think of this region as a curve, but perturbed. We call the collapse a dynamical process, so it will, perturbation will be emitted, gravitational wave, and so on. So, it we expect to find here a, a perturbed curve. As I mentioned before, so this is the external universe. Here is time like infinity. This is the infinite time of the external universe. As I mentioned before, outside, we, we know that black holes have no hair, which means that all, all transients decay, and asymptotically we have a hair solution with a decaying perturbation, which is very small. But what's going on inside? So it turns out that inside, the situation is more tricky in the neighborhood of this surface. And this is the argument that was found by by Penrose already 50 years ago. Penrose showed that this hype, so consider an observer which falls in and cross this uh, inner horizon. Penrose showed that all the radiation that will fall in from the external universe, he, he will see them with blue shift. And the blue shift factor grows and diverges when the observer approaches the inner horizon. Why is it that? So, so I'll try to de describe it on a diagram. On this diagram. So suppose that there is an external, a, a external emitter, static one, which sends inside the signal at a given frequency. So his word line, for example, R equals constant, looks like this. It emits signal at some omega zero. And, and t is time, t grow, it grows, and it is, it is a feature of Penrose diagram, diagram that this point corresponds to t, it goes to infinity, that's time like infinity. And then it emits infinite number of signals in. And so on. Now, they must crowd because they are infinite up to here, so they crowd. And now, consider and a free falling observer fall here, falls here. Now, it, uh, this observer arrives at this point at a finite time, because in horizon is just a finite place inside the bulk of space. So, so this observer receives an infinite number of pulses within a finite proper time. Therefore, the, obviously, the, the wavelength of the the period must go to zero. Period of the met, of the detected waves must go to zero, which means that observed omega go to infinity. Or in other words, the gradient of the field, suppose that it is some electromagnetic field, sinusoidal. So outside it has a, a finite gradient or 
rate of change, but for this observer, all rates of changes of fields falling in will diverge at the inner horizon. It, it turns out that the measured omega will be, will go like, like it for, will be proportional, it will go exponentially, like e to the kappa time v, where v is the Eddington coordinate, that Eddington Finkelstein coordinate that goes to infinity. In this direction, it's kind of tightly linked to the asymptotic time outside the black hole, and kappa is the surface gravity, but this is, I'll, I'll denote kappa minus, it is the surface gravity of the inner horizon. That's, the, that's why I have the, the subject minus here. It's not that of the event horizon, but that of the inner horizon. It's positive parameter. So here the troubles start. Uh, then Pen Penrose said that, that uh, if radiation is infinitely blue shifted, certainly energy density will, go, will diverge here, and its back reaction so via the Einstein equation, we diverge here too. So the conclusion is that there must, according to Penrose's argument 50 years ago, that in reality, when perturbations are added, instead of a, of a regular uh, geometry, we, we should expect it to be replaced somehow by some kind of curvature singularity. Whether it is here or could develop due to linearities earlier, it was not clear at that time. But some singularity should take place. So then uh, this issue was uh, later analyzed. Uh, first of <coughs> all, for spherically charged black hole by, by uh, this group, person in Israel, a uh, mass inflation paper, and uh, I also uh, contributed. And later on, in the 90s, uh, people started to explore what was going on in a spinning black hole. And I got, I'm more focused today on the spinning black hole. <coughs> more relevant, and what, what was found is that, is that indeed a curvature singularity form, but it is formed exactly on this null surface. So it is a null singularity. It was also found first by perturbative analysis, <coughs> and very recently on also mathematically by Fermos and Luke uh, last year. Uh, but initially it was perturbatively, that this null singularity is what we call weak. It is weak singularity. What does it mean? It has two aspects which are close and very tightly linked to each other. First of all, you look at the metric with appropriate coordinates, you will see that although there is a curvature singularity, the metric does not diverge or does not, uh, does not become singular it gets a well-defined limiting value at the Cauchy horizon. So we say that the metric is C0 all the way up to the Cauchy horizon and also at the Cauchy horizon. The other aspect is more physically what happens to an extended object that, that falls in. So we know that tidal forces will deform it, stretch it. Now here, curvature diverges. Riemann tensor diverges here which means that the tidal force diverges. So naively we could think, okay, if tidal force diverges, nothing will be able to stand it, and it will be either crushed to zero volume, or maybe stretched to infinity. It turns out that here it does not happen. It diverges, but to go from tidal forces to actual, actual deformation, we need to do double time, a proper time integral like going in Newtonian mechanics from acceleration to, from forcing to minimum acceleration to displacement, you need to integrate, integrate twice. The same here. It turns out that curvature goes up, but the metric doesn't. So, okay, so it, the, the, that tidal forces blow up, but the actual deformation is finite. Actually, it is also very small in this region. The, tidal, the actual deformation grows if we meet this singularity at later time. So it starts with zero magnitude here and grows. So this is the nature of the singularity here. 
Now, this was the first singularity that was found inside already in, uh, in the 90s, the years of the 90s. However, later it was found that this is not the only singular element. And there is a simple argument that tells us that something stronger should also take place. And what is the argument? So let's consider for simplicity for the moment the spherical case, which is easier to discuss. So each point is actually actually corresponds to a two sphere with some finite radius. radius. <coughs> In the north form, the radius is fixed. It's called R minus, a fixed finite radius. But here we also added perturbations and, and energy or effective energy crosses in the horizon and causing it to shrink just by the Nietzsche two equation or by the Einstein equation. Due to the perturbation, these two spheres shrink monotonically. And it, we are assured from the equations, from the Nietzsche two equation, for example, that at some point it will crash to zero. And then something stronger must happen. So indeed, uh, uh, indeed, it was found quite soon by numerical simulation that when this weak singularity crashes to zero area, another singularity <coughs> forming, which is space-like singularity, it is strong. It is in a spherical case, it is r equal zero. So I put your question marks for, for the spin case, in which it was not, has not been shown yet. In the spherical symmetric case, it, it was shown first by, uh, by uh, Brady and Smith, and then also later on by other uh, people who did numerical. So what people did here, and I also was involved in, in one of some simulations, but only recently, that you take a, a, a spherically symmetric charge black hole and you add a, a, a simply a, a scalar field but a self-gravitating one. Then you, you evolve it numerically, you can solve it analytically, and you find that a strong field singularity forms. What happened in the spinning case? The same, the same shrinkage of the inner, of the Cauchy horizon occurs also in the spinning case. It should shrink to zero, zero area. And then it is reasonable to expect that a strong singularity, space like singularity, will form. It's not obvious. It's uh, still, still in, in uh, still not clear. It hasn't been shown yet. It is very hard to show it because you know, we don't know how to approach this problem analytically. But hopefully, with numerics, it may be be possible to to show. This was found in, I don't Sorry, know. Sorry, in the limit of the spin goes to zero, you already have shown that the space time singularity happens. So, so it happened already before. Do you expect to have a continuous transition between a spinning and non-spinning? Uh, the transition, even in the, even in the, in the non-spinning case, it, we don't know to show it analytically. It was only shown numerically. So it's not clear, it's to me, it's not clear if we add angular momentum, whether it will survive or not. I do, I should say that I, it looks to me very conceivable that it will survive, but we still lack positive evidence for this. <coughs> Continuity, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it will work because it is a singularity. So. Okay, so, so these are two singular elements, the weak one and the strong one. But more recently, we became aware of a new singular component in this picture. And this is what we call an effective shock. Now, it is on the inner horizon, in some sense. But there are two, you must recall that there are two sections of the inner horizon. The Nalvik, the Cauchy horizon here, is a, 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 there is a, null singular, a weak singularity there. And here there is another another singular element, or effectively singular element, which is a, a shock wave. So this was found uh, six years ago. And why, what does it mean? What kind of structure do we have? So, so here is, this, this is a space-time diagram. By, by the way, so I should say, this is very confusing and delicate. This space-time diagram was 
So in the, let's start, well, in the spherical charge case, it was explored numerically and constructed numerically uh, 20 years ago. And when you just do numerical solution of the Einstein equation, you don't see any special property. What do you need to do in order to, to, to notice the shock? You need to send geodesics from outside to the interior to cross this, this uh, region. And you need to look what happened, what will be the experience of the geodesics when they jump at later and later times. So that's what I'm doing. I want to, to uh, so this is a space-time diagram. This is spatial singularity. Now, uh, I want to, so, so again, to understand it in the simplest way, let's again consider the spherical symmetric case. So some infalling observer that hits here, it's R value, R is a measure of the two spheres at each moment, which is an invariant property at each point here. If a function of tau, how, how does it look like? So, so I, I'll draw a diagram. Simplified diagram, then later I'll show also numerical results. So this is R is a function of tau. So let's first start from Ryder Nordstrom. In Ryder Nordstrom, R decreases monotonically until it gets to a minimum and then it bounces. Where here is could be R plus. R plus is a value of R at the event horizon and then at the inner horizon. This is a crucial, crucial line here. There is another line R, mi R minus. And in Ryder Nordstrom, it crosses both lines and then bounces. What happens here? Here it's different. It crosses R plus, and then it decreases monotonically, all the way up to R equals zero. This is because the scalar field created a, a singularity. It's no longer Ryder Nordstrom. So, so now, R of tau would look, let's say, something like this. And then I want to ask what, how much proper time it took it to go from R minus to R equal zero. So this is R equal zero. So let's call it delta tau, denote it by delta tau. So now, okay, there is some delta tau. Now the question is, I take the same type of free falling geodesic, of orbit or geodesic, but send it in at later time. So now it looks like this, and later, <coughs> like this. How we can look at this diagram? What Simple analysis show, once you focus on that question, you see it's simple to analyze, you see that the late infallers actually initially will, will go very close to the Ryder Nordstrom, few Ryder Nordstrom curve, up to the moment that they arrive in the neighborhood of R minus, the inner horizon, and they very sharply, they they fall to R equal zero, very short proper time. So delta, so, so if I add, now I want to ask how, del, how is delta tau? Delta tau is a proper time to go from R minus to R equal zero. How does it depend on the moment the object fell into the black hole? So let's call this moment VH, V horizon, Eddington coordinate at the horizon. So later, Late in folders have large uh, v horizon. So simple analysis shows that it, it actually at large in full time it behaves like e to the kappa minus kappa vh, which means that the amount of proper time to go from here to here decays exponentially with the in full time into the black hole, which means that if you wait one day after the collapse, or let's say one week, if you want to talk about the supermassive black hole, this is already much, much smaller than Planck time. So in, in the physical sense, you consider of, of it as a momentary approach from R minus to R equal zero. But it's actually one over, the, oh my God, as you already told us before, right? Sorry, can you repeat? It was actually, the omega measure was actually into plus case. Yes, yes, the... so yeah, you are right. So this, this, exponent actually appears in various phenomena, which means that they are somewhat related. But yeah, it appears in various, the same exponent appears. So let me just show you And what some. is the relation then, do you know? Uh, 
So I'm not completely sure how, what is the best viewpoint, but we, do, we don't have enough time to discuss it maybe later. And I'm going to discuss it with the guys here. And, and so, so now I'm going to show you results which I which, uh, were prepared uh, uh, by my graduate student uh, who they alone published two years ago. I'll show you the reference soon. But this is, uh, again, out of tau for various uh, this is an early folder and later and later and later. You see that this is a rising mode form. Yeah. <laughs> it gets closer, it becomes more, more, a, more steep for later geodesic. And I, when I go to really later geodesic, so this number is the info V adding tone. So here it go up from minus three up to minus one. Here it's 10, 20, and so on up, up to 30. You see that in this level of resolution, just follow the radial north to curve, and then in, within vanishingly short proper time, fall to zero. Here is a zoom. I want just to show a zoom on this region here. So, so this is a zoom of this region. And for later and later geodesic, you get closer to the radial north to curve, and it becomes sharper. So this is an effective uh, shock. Um, and I should say, uh, it was, uh, it was found theoretically in, in, uh, six years ago, and, and numeric, numerically we did it with a good A loan published two years ago, and that was, that was only for the spherical, spherical charge. And now I learned to know that here, the group here, Paul, uh, Paul and his collaborators, actually explored numerically the case of spinning black hole and, uh, and uh, this perturbation, which is much more difficult, much more physical, and they, I think, agree that they expose, expose exactly this same shock phenomenon, which to me is quite kind of exciting to see that. Numeris also show this in the most physical case of a, of a spinning a black hole. Now, there is a very simple, uh, uh, analytical way to show the occurrence of the, sh of the shock, but it's, I don't have enough time to show it. It is, uh, it is described in the original analytical data. So, okay. So, um, okay, so we have three singular uh, components inside the black hole. All this region is no longer relevant. We do have some question marks here uh, for the, in the spinny case, if there is a space like similarity. Uh, but there is a much larger question mark, in my view, sorry, which is here. The question is, what's going here? So formally, we could say, OK, there is a singularity here. We don't care. That's the end of one. However, this is a weak singularity. So physical probes arrive the Cauchy horizon intact. And also the metric, if you want to so that the question, the metric arrives in C0. So it is compelling to think that that physics should somehow extend beyond it. But we don't know how, because even before a singularity form here, even in, without the dimension, it is it was a Cauchy horizon. There is no unique prediction. So that's the greatest uh, question mark. Now, all the discussion, okay, I think I'm, that, okay, so that's a physical description, very, 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 very short, okay, very, very short description of what happens classically inside the black hole. I just in one sentence that it is quite obvious that semi classical uh, uh, Phenomena like those responsible to rocking radiation, but now inside the black hole, they will have a dramatic effect uh, inside, and just presently I am uh, exploring uh, this semi classical uh, aspect. So thank you very much. Questions for Amos?
we will talk in more detail later. But this picture that you showed us, you basically said this geodesic can come up to here, more or less following Reisner Nordstrom, and then in a vanishingly small time <coughs> you go to the singularity. Yes, yes. What about a geodesic that comes like this and does that? How do you describe it in this picture? Because so, this, this is not R equal to so, zero. So let me try to explain. So I'm talking <coughs> in the limit. So what? So this phenomenon, which is the only in effect you showed, only appears in the limit of late mm -hmm. observer. In this limit, you pick any geodesic and, and just time translate it to the future here, you don't have the geodesic. Because in Radio Nordstrom, you have original Radio Nordstrom. You, you, either, you either have geodesic which cross here or geodesic which cross here. Yeah. Now, those which cross here, at the limit, they, uh, they uh, are pushed to here, to the corner. Those who, all the co all those who in Radio, so I should also say that at late times, geometry here, if you jump very late, is in Radio Nordstrom. I don't know for okay. I mean, I talk about that not, but same for okay. So, if you do this asymptotically later than not to, you pick one which crosses the, and, and go like this, then it will necessarily run to R equal zero at the limit of late time. So, Even only if you pick one which in Radio North School would meet at the corner here, at the, at the bifurcation point here then this one could be, this special one could be, but maybe it will be uh, not included in, in the shock uh, behavior. So, so the bottom line here is the late infalling observers always have the r equals zero singularity. If they take an orbit in their asymptotic radio notion, if they take an orbit which crosses this section of the horizon, then yes, then we go to but The Penrose diagram says you can go this way. Right, it is still yes. a time like it's, it's not geodesic, though. Right? It's, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's not a geodesic, but you know, I can take my little rocket and oh, yeah, turn around there. Yes, yes. So, you, maybe <laughs> you, you would have to have an extremely powerful the, rocket. Right? It's <laughs> a limiting, <laughs> the, we have a limiting okay, big rocket, not so a you have yeah, to yeah. overcome this so, exponential. So, I agree that geodesics there is geodesic that cross here, but if you take any geodesic from here, which would like here, which would like to cross this, and you time translate it, then it will rush to, to R equal zero. Eric? So, uh, semi-classically, we expect the event horizon to uh, to uh, evaporate in finite time. Yes. So, what do, we, do you have anything to say about what, what the late time guys who are coming up and might hit the event horizon here? <coughs> might, might see oh, about, the event horizon or the inner No, the, 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 the inner horizon, because yeah. they're, not, they're not going to see the event horizon. Presumably. Yeah, okay, so so yeah, if this is an evaporating black hole semi-classical, then let's pretend that this is the end of evaporation. And now sky goes like this. So we have event horizon comes to, to end, and then there is a Cauchy horizon. And then what something one thing is very clear that if falling observer will find strong fluxes diverging fluxes, semi-classical fluxes, as they approach the inner horizon. So now I'm talking about TGV, which means energy flux in this direction. So, so um, the infolders will see it diverging at the inner horizon, which of course raises what the issue, the question of back reaction, which we don't know. There is a lot of work to I should must one sentence to mention, sorry, I, this is my commitment to Paul, <laughs> that eventually a late observer will just feel care up to the inner horizon, and then with vanishing proper time, physically vanishing proper time, will, will crash to zero volume. He will not feel anything. He will not, he will not have the chance to know that there are deviations from, from what the to 
I think it is a quite a peaceful way to pass away. <laughs> it's, it's like uh, being asleep at the wheel and driving into a brick wall. Okay. <laughs> I would have called this infinitely violent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> semantics. semantics. <laughs> All right. So, are there any further questions? Uh, so, at, at the shock, you say that there, the curvature does not diverge, but you can only feel. I mean, uh, you can only feel the shock by geodesics that pass through it. This kind of, sounds kind of similar to what happens in the Aristarchus. So, actually. so what you see is that. So now the question here, are we talking about component or about scales? <coughs> if you're talking about, about component, it is sensitive to how, how you define your product. So let's talk, talk about the scalar. When you look at, the, for example, the Kretschmann scalar, you will see that it diverges <coughs> exponentially in the usual exponential rate, but that uh, But, it, so yeah, does diverge like e to z? To what? Two kappa minus v here, but this it's hard to say that this divergence has to do with the shock because it, it's, it is more related to the Cauchy horizon. That, that's the rate of divergence on approaching the Cauchy horizon. So the shock is not special to this system. What is special? If you look, so if you cross here, and these these are things that, that Paul and his collaborators computed in Kerr. And uh, very, very, uh, very nice results. So for for any observer, there is a finite value of Kretschmann as you cross. Okay, there, okay. there is a there is a curve how uh, of Kretschmann as a function of proper time, and you will see that the delta tau characterizing this this uh, curve becomes shorter, like the shock wave phenomenon. But the magnitude also goes exponential, yes. All right, with that said, let's thank our, let's thank us again, and uh, <laughs> let's move on to our next speaker. Our uh, next speaker will be Eric. Oh, oh, did I? <laughs> uh, who's the next speaker, Paul? Yes. yes. All right, sorry for that. Speaker is Grant uh, Rimmon, Rimmon. Yep. from uh, Berkeley. He's a Miller Fellow there, and uh, he's going to be telling us about the weak gravity conjecture from black hole entropy. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Harvard. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that I did with collaborators from Caltech, uh, Cliff Chung and Junyu Liu, on connecting the weak gravity conjecture with self consistency of the entropy of black holes. So uh, I know this is an audience of people from various departments, so I'll uh, give some motivation for what the weak gravity conjecture is and why we should care about it uh, before I get into what we did. So there's this set of ideas called uh, the Swamp Land Program, which basically asks the question of, when we, when we think of theory space, the set of uh, you know, actions for the laws of physics, we uh, have handed to us by string theory some landscape of self-consistent, low-energy, uh, effective theories. But there are lots of low-energy theories you could have written down that, it turns out, perhaps surprisingly, are not given to you by any ultraviolet completion, uh, any consistent uh, quantum gravitational ultraviolet completion in string theory. So a question we ask ourselves is, how do we uh, determine the boundary between uh, this landscape of good uh, sets of laws of physics and the swampland of actions that naively seem fine but are secretly inconsistent. So uh, the main way uh, we go about this, as we should, is to 
look at examples. So what people have done is observe lots of UV-complete examples, uh, toy models in string theory, and uh, made conjectures by noticing patterns. So in 2006, Nino Arkani Hamed, Kumran Bapa, and friends uh, noticed that in string theories, you typically have uh, particles whose uh, charges exceed their mass in Planck units. And so they formulated this into uh, something called the weak gravity conjecture, which I'll get to momentarily. But the other side of the coin you could ask is, what bounds a set of consistent EFTs in the first place? What sets the bounds on theory space itself? Uh, what uh, effective theories can we write down that are uh, that seem okay, and what can we write down that's actually just sick from the start? Maybe it violates causality or violates unitarity of quantum mechanics or something like that. So there's been this parallel program of proving bounds on effective field theories using infrared physics principles uh, by being very agnostic about the ultraviolet completion of gravity. And the principles that people typically use uh, for this program are things like, as I said, quantum mechanical unitarity, causality of signal propagation, uh, analyticity of scattering amplitudes, and the like. And you can prove lots of different bounds on gravitational effective field theories in this way. But uh, in this talk, I'm going to address a question that sort of connects these two approaches and ask, are these boundaries ever the same? That is, is the, does the landscape ever run up against the boundary of self-consistent uh, low-energy theories to start with? Or in other words, can we ever see the boundary of the landscape purely by uh, playing around with the infrared? And what I'll argue in this talk is that, at least for the case of the weak gravity conjecture, the answer is yes. So what I'll be doing is I'll be, uh, under certain assumptions, proving the weak gravity conjecture by using a new infrared argument related to black hole entropy. So it won't involve causality or unitarity, just uh, self-consistency of the walled entropy for black holes. You're asking, are there boundaries where there's no swamp land between the between and Right, and between the landscape and things that are just IR inconsistent uh, to begin with. Yep. All right, so what do I mean by the weak gravity conjecture? Uh, this is an ultraviolet consistency condition for quantum gravity. And the precise statement, uh, there, there are lots of versions of the weak gravity conjecture in the literature, but I'll be proving the weak form electric of the weak gravity conjecture which is just a statement that for any abelian gauge theory coupled consistently to quantum gravity, there is always a state in the spectrum with charge Q and mass M such that Q over M is bigger than 1 in Planck units. So for that state, gravity is the weakest force. Uh, two of uh, those states uh, repel each other rather than <coughs> attract. Now, why should this be true? Well, uh, we know of no example in string theory where this fails. There is always some state uh, floating around in the spectrum for which this is true. Moreover, uh, there is a, a original justification based on black hole decay. Uh, we know that black holes Hawking radiate and can decay, and if they're charged, they can swing or pair produce uh, charged particles, but they can only do that if there are uh, particles in the spectrum that have charge to mass ratio larger than the charge to mass ratio of the original black hole. You have to conserve charge, you have to conserve energy, and you have to give some energy to the decay products, so uh, Q over M of the decay products is larger than the Q over M of the original black hole, and if you want black holes to decay, uh, for all black holes up to and including extremal black holes, you need something with Q over M bigger than one. Now, whether or not you buy this argument is a matter of taste, I won't be using this argument at all, but it gives you a flavor of the original reason for why people wanted the weak gravity conjecture to be true. It was to avoid black hole remnants, avoid a, an infinite tower of exactly stable states uh, in, in the spectrum of the theory. Okay. All right, so let's get into uh, what we actually did. So consider a thermodynamic stop experiment. We'll consider a theory, uh, L tilde, uh, that's just pure Einstein-Maxwell theory, no higher derivative terms, and a theory L tilde plus delta L, which is Einstein-Maxwell plus higher derivative terms. And those higher derivative terms come from integrating out massive states uh, in the UV that generate the higher curvature terms. <coughs> so you might imagine, when you compute the entropy for a black hole of the same charge and mass in these two theories, that the, that the black hole with the higher derivative terms should have higher entropy, because we've integrated out some extra states in, in quantum field theory, uh, and we ignore those extra microstates at low energies. So that's motivation, but I'll argue for that shortly why that should be true. All right, but what, uh, what are the changes to the entropy? Well, okay, there are just explicit extra 
terms in the entropy coming from the <coughs> formula. Uh, in the new theory, it's not just uh, the area of the black hole, but there are extra terms. Moreover, since we're holding charge and mass fixed at infinity, but changing the equations of motion by adding in uh, nonlinear terms to the Einstein and Maxwell equations, the area changes a little bit when we hold the charge and mass fixed. So we need to take into account both of those effects. Okay, so here's the theory we're considering. Einstein Maxwell plus all uh, higher derivative terms up to order uh, four in derivatives. So I've thrown out anything that's a total derivative, and anything that involves explicit derivatives of f can be rearranged into curvatures or into current terms that I can drop since I'll be considering a Riesel Nordstrom black hole with no charged matter floating around. Okay. So what I want to prove using this thermodynamics type of argument is a set of positivity bounds on the CI. And then I'll demonstrate at the end that surprisingly this bound proves the weak gravity conjecture. Okay. So why should delta S be positive? Why should the wall entropy of the corrected black hole be bigger than the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the original black hole? All right. So for the purposes of this proof, I'm assuming that uh, there are quantum fields at some mass scale m phi within the regime of validity of effective field theory, such that when I integrate out those fields, I get the higher curvature operators. Now, even though I'm writing it as phi, phi is not necessarily a scalar. It can have spin. It doesn't matter, our argument's totally agnostic about that, but it's important uh, for the argument that the higher curvature terms are generated classically, that is, at tree level, in terms of finding the diagrams. This is quite generic in string theory, for example, if you uh, take uh, supersymmetric theory and then break supersymmetry at some scale, the dilaton will uh, get a mass, and it'll, it'll uh, couple uh, in, in the way we're assuming. Finally, I'll be considering uh, black holes that are highly charged enough such that their specific heat is positive. So in four dimensions, this requires Q over M bigger than root three over two. Okay, so I can uh, write down the path integral. So here I is the total Euclidean action. Uh, F is a free energy. And I'll write beta as the inverse temperature of the perturbed black hole. So beta tilde is the original inverse temperature. And I get I by formally uh, doing the path integral over the phi field. So I have some I uv, I, uh, I integrate out phi, and I get the effective uh, Euclidean action. Now, on shell, phi doesn't want to be zero. Since phi uh, couples at tree level, uh, phi wants to be of order the curvature or of order f squared. So setting phi to zero means going off shell. But I'm allowed to evaluate the action at whatever field configuration I like, just as a, as a math question. And as a purely math statement, if I pin phi to zero, then the UV Euclidean action just equals the pure Einstein-Maxwell Euclidean action for some metric and gauge field configuration because of, because of how it couples. It couples at tree level. If I turn it to zero, then all of the effects of the higher derivative terms are gone. That's an off-shell statement. But this observation will allow us to compare black hole entropies in two different theories while secretly just working in a, in a single theory and going on the shell. Okay, so here's where we get the inequality. So by definition of the saddle point approximation, minus log z of beta equals i u v evaluated on the, on the saddle point. If that extremum is a local minimum, I'll come back to that shortly, then this is less than uh, that same u v action evaluated at some off-shell configuration which by the relation I just proved on the last slide equals I tilde evaluated at that same configuration, which by the saddle point approximation again equals minus log z tilde of beta. Now importantly, log z tilde of beta is not the free energy of a pure Rice and Nordstrom black hole of mass m since beta is the perturbed inverse temperature. So we have to take into account how the temperature has shifted, or in other words, how the mass has shifted to keep the temperature constant. So if we do that, uh, we can write log z tilde of beta in terms of uh, the free energy of a pure Rice and Nordstrom black hole plus some temperature correction. So putting everything together and reshuffling terms using thermodynamic identities, we get delta S is positive. So the one extra assumption uh, I made was that uh, the saddle point is actually a local minimum. Now, you might worry about conformal saddle point instabilities, but those have been shown to be gauge artifacts. But the Euclidean Schwarzschild black hole does have a real uh, bona fide instability, and indeed it, its saddle point is not a local minimum. But people have shown that as when you choose a black hole with uh, positive specific heat, where Q of M is bigger than root 3 over 2, all those instabilities go away, and indeed 
the saddle point is a local minimum. So I'll be considering black holes with that charge to mass ratio. Okay, so <coughs> that's the setup. Uh, and now we can go ahead and derive our inequalities. So um, just for convenience, I'm going to rescale the uh, Wilson coefficients of the higher dimension operators by various powers of Planck mass just to put everything in the same units. So here the di's just go like 1 over the mass of whatever, 1 over the mass squared of whatever state I'm integrating up. Now, we're computing a difference in entropy between the black hole in the original theory and the new theory. But we want to get uh, an inequality on the di's. So we have to make sure that any of the other effects coming from introducing these higher dimension operators are much, much smaller than the change in entropy uh, from just the walled type terms that we care about. So for example, you could worry about renormalization of Newton's constant, which we can estimate. Or you could worry about uh, the effects of loop level completions of gravitational higher dimension operators. But we can estimate uh, all those different effects. And uh, when all of a sudden that, all right, so for a black hole of size rho and of charge roughly equal to its mass, we have the Bekenstein Hawking term, loop correction to G Newton, loop correction to delta L, tree contribution to delta L, and everything else is smaller. So we want this term to beat this and this. It will always beat this, but in order to beat the loop correction to G Newton, we can't take our black hole too large. Uh, we have to uh, have rho much smaller than 1 over kappa m pi to the d over 2. That's okay. That's still consistent with the EFT, where rho has to be much, much bigger than 1 over m phi, because we have two mass scales to play with, m phi and the Planck mass. And as long as m phi is much smaller than the Planck mass, there's a window where we can uh, take the black hole and our argument goes through. All right. So now let's, uh, let's derive the inequality. So I'm considering a Rice and Nordstrom spacetime, where I define the charge and mass at infinity using the Komar formalism or ABM or whatever formalism you like, as long as it's at infinity, which means that the higher dimension operators don't affect the definition of the mass. Uh, I'll choose relativist units where there's various factors of root 2 that become convenient, and I'll define the charge to mass ratio parameter psi, which goes to 0 for extremal black holes and 1 for uncharged black holes. Okay? Uh, we're, as I said, considering a Rice and Nordstrom metric uh, outside the outer horizon, so uh, we won't be worrying about any of the structure of, uh, of the interior. But we want to uh, figure out how to incorporate the effects of the higher dimension operators, how to uh, find the metric for the corrected black hole, corrected by all these higher derivative terms. Uh, the way to do that has been shown in a paper by Katz, Model, and Potty from 06. Uh, for a spherically symmetric metric, you can invert the Ricci tensor, and you can think of all the higher dimension operators as coming from essentially sources in T mu. You can treat the change in the Lagrangian as just some matter term. So, okay. There are two places where that shows up. There's an explicit contribution just coming from the correction to the Einstein equations. But there's going to be another contribution because Maxwell's equations are now nonlinear, so they change uh, the gauge field of the Rice and Nordstrom solution, and that'll lead into uh, yet another uh, source effect. All right, so it's uh, sort of messy to do this, but it's not as bad as it looks because you can plug in uh, the Reissner Nordstrom solution, uh, the, the uncorrected Reissner Nordstrom solution, everywhere, since we only care to first order in the coefficients. All right, so we do that for the Maxwell and Einstein equations, and ultimately we get, uh, so here's the RR component of the metric. It's just the usual Reissner Nordstrom form plus a bunch of corrections. All right, so uh, I can expand out the entropy, and there are three terms I have to care about. This first term is just. Uh, this first term is just the Bekenstein-Hawking term. The second term is the explicit interaction contribution coming from the walled entropy from just differentiating delta L with respect to the Riemann tensor. And the third term is just delta A over 4G. It's just the shift in area. So let's compute those two terms. All right, uh, I won't go through all the details of that. But uh, when all is said and done, you get a new set of positivity bounds. So this is delta S. And it's required to be positive for all psi uh, between 0 and 1 half, uh, where 1 half is where uh, the specific heat crosses from positive to negative, and 0 is an extremal black hole. So I can write this in terms of, I'll define some d naught, some random looking combination of the higher dimension operator coefficients. And the bound lives in the space of d naught, d3, and d6. And so this is uh, an infinite parameter, or an infinite number of linearly independent bounds, since this is a, a convex region in uh, parameter space. All right, 
so this is what it looks like. Uh, you're required to live inside inside of this funny shaped wedge. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now you can see how it's uh, how it's complex. All right. Uh, so here's here's a few projections, but you can see whether D3 is positive or negative. Uh, so uh, anything shaded is an excluded region. D0 is required to be uh, positive. All right. Uh, we get that D0 is positive by taking the near extremal limit of our bounds, <coughs> and I claim that this implies the weak gravity conjecture. How is that? Well, when we added the higher derivative terms to Einstein-Maxwell theory, we changed the set of physical black holes in the theory, that is, the set of black holes that have no naked singularities. In pure Einstein-Maxwell, you're allowed to have charge-to-mass ratios between 0 and 1. But now, with the higher derivative terms, the set of black holes with no naked singularities is between 0 and 1 plus delta z, where delta z is something we can compute from the new metric for the corrected black hole. And indeed, when we compute delta z, it goes like the exact same combination of coefficients that we earlier proved is positive. So that means that self-consistency of black hole entropy implies that delta z is positive, which means that there are black holes in the theory with charge to mass ratios ever so slightly larger than 1 which means the black holes themselves are the states you need to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, and we're done. Uh, that is, we could plot uh, the set of states uh, by mass and charge to mass ratio. So uh, in the uncorrected Einstein-Maxwell theory, it would just be a line at 1. And under higher derivative operators, it could have gone either way, either like this or like this. But we've shown that self-consistency of black hole entropy means it has to go up so the large black holes are able to decay to the smaller extremal black holes and so on, down to something uh, in the Planck scale where the theory breaks down and we can't say anything more. But the infinite tower of you know, astrophysical masses uh, of extremal black holes just goes away. In fact, this generalizes to even uh, more generalized forms of the weak gravity conjecture. If you have multiple gauge fields floating around, uh, I've shown previously that in order to be consistent with the weak gravity conjecture, it's not enough to just have a state with q over m bigger than 1 along each direction in charge space. Instead, what you have to do is plot all the light states and draw the convex hull, and that convex hull has to contain the unit ball in order for all the black holes to decay. And if we run through the entropy argument with uh, a multi-charge theory, we indeed get that same, uh, that same thing out. And so what we end up finding is that consistency of black hole entropy even proves a generalized form of the weak gravity conjecture. The, uh, the, the ball, or the, the, the sphere of extremal black holes in charged mass space uh, expands outward in all directions under higher, dimen higher dimension operators. Um, this generalizes to arbitrary dimension. Everything gets addressed with uh, ugly looking functions of dimension. But uh, as before, taking the near extremal limit implies that a particular combination is positive, and it's that same combination that shows up in uh, the correction to the extremality bound. So we've, we've done more than just prove the weak gravity conjecture. As you saw, we actually had some large uh, family of positivity bounds indexed by the charge to mass ratio, and they all had to be true. So we can, given that uh, set of statements, do some sanity checks and, and make, sure, uh, make sure it makes sense. So let's, uh, let, let's do some of those right now. First, any physical observable should be invariant under a reparameterization of the field variables. Uh, so nature doesn't care about what we call things, therefore we can do field redefinitions and uh, physics shouldn't change. So let me change uh, g mu nu to g mu nu plus some combination of operators where r1, 2, 3, and 4 are just arbitrary numbers. This has the effect of shifting the action and thereby shifting the higher dimension operator coefficients. So if someone walks up to you on the street and hands you an r plus r squared action and says, oh, these are the coefficients, that's not terribly meaningful. All that's meaningful is uh, those coefficients modulo uh, field redefinition. I think if somebody walks up to you on the street and hands you any action, it's meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Not for the same <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, but none nonetheless, there are four uh, linear combinations that are field redefinition invariant. And they are exactly the D0 that we found previously, D3, D6, and D9, some other combination that just doesn't show up in our bounds. So since our bounds 
and the total entropy shift delta s were all built out of d naught, d three, and d six. They're manifestly field redefinition invariant. So that's good. Uh, let's look at some concrete examples. If we turn off gravity and look at only photon self interactions, so we only have d seven and d eight, uh, those last two operators, the two f to the fourth operators, our bound becomes simply two d seven plus d eight is positive. But you can compute uh, bounds on photon-photon operators through analyticity of scattering amplitudes in, in the way that uh, Adams or Connie Hammond and others did in 2006. And indeed, one of the bounds you get is that 2d7 plus d8 is positive. So our results are at least consistent with analyticity bounds. Another thing you can do is just uh, pick a toy level, com a, a toy completion. So uh, take a massive scalar, couple it to r and f squared with arbitrary coefficients, and compute uh, the higher dimension operator coefficients by integrating out phi. <coughs> when you do, you get uh, these di's, and our bound uh, on d naught just becomes something that's a perfect square, and so it's manifestly positive. So that's nice. We can look at string theory. For example, if we take the low energy description of the heterotic string, freeze uh, the dilaton to some value, and just read off what the higher dimension operator coefficients are, you can dig these up in the literature, and then our bound just uh, becomes that this particular combination of dimension and psi is positive. So here I'm imagining taking the heterotic string and compactifying it onto some d-dimensional uh, But this is indeed always positive for all dimensions and all psi. So our bound manifestly works. So, okay, just to remind you what we've done. We've relied on a universal notion of thermodynamic entropy, just that delta S is positive when you integrate out uh, states in QFT that generate higher dimension operators and translated that into a set of inequalities on the Wilson coefficients of higher dimension operators in the Einstein-Maxwell effective field theory. We've shown that one of those particular bounds coincides precisely with what you need to guarantee that black holes can have charge to mass ratios slightly larger than one, uh, thereby proving the weak gravity conjecture. And we found that this generalizes to multiple gauge fields, arbitrary dimensions, but we're still, uh, we're, we're looking at other directions we could take this. For example, you could imagine passing through a bunch of uh, mass shells. So if you have uh, some, some uh, state and then some other state that's much, much lighter and some other one that's much, much lighter, so some large hierarchy, uh, you should get that delta S is positive as you pass through each mass shell. And that suggests that maybe uh, DS is kind of like an A theorem type parameter that's parametrizing RG flow. And indeed it would be if, uh, if we could show that our argument works not only for tree level completions, but also loop level completions, which we, which we expect to be true. Um, another thing I should point out is that the positivity of the entropy shifts really comes from UV state counting, right? It's counting uh, the numbers of states that we integrated out and assigning an entropy to them. That's sort of morally similar to the way that other positivity bounds on effective field theories, non-gravitational effective field theories, have been proven, where you, uh, you prove positivity by integrating over some cross-section in the UV, which is also fundamentally about counting the states in the UV. So there's, there, there might be a reason why our bound is, is related to these other uh, IR approaches. Uh, but but the, the takeaway is that there remains to be, um, there's much that remains to be done in uh, separating the landscape from the swampland. And it's exciting because we're continuing to discover new tools to do this with. So, thanks. Well, so what, what I was uh, trying to say is that these higher dimension operators cannot change the definition of charge and mass appropriately defined because charge and mass are really just measures of gravitational and electric fluxes at infinity. And the effects of higher dimension operators, just by power counting, will fall off with radius much, much faster than the, than the leading level gravitational and electric uh, fields. And so at infinity, you just, you can't notice them. Uh, they yeah, they fall off with higher powers of R. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you that if you consider the side operator like a derivatives, it's true. But if you, if you just have accidentally feel like a phi, and right. you just consider that kind of interaction, they wouldn't, I would, say that they wouldn't just suppress, right? Uh, it, it, it would still be suppressed. So in, in other words, you're saying, forget the EFT, just go in the full UV completion and write down the solution. Uh, the, the full UV completion can only 
deviate from the EFT solution by, by something that's very small, right? That's of order, that's on distance scales of order one over m phi. And anything that cares about distance scales of one over m phi should be invisible to something that you're measuring at infinity. So what part of your uh, argument break down for loop coupled? Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So let me see. So, yeah. We, we made our money by uh, taking phi off shell and noting that when we went off shell, the theory, uh, by, by setting phi to zero, the theory reduced from, uh, the, the effective action reduced from the UV action to just the pure uh, Einstein-Maxwell action. If I have if I have a loop uh, completion like let's say I have an operator that looks like phi squared r and I integrate out a, a loop of phi to get r squared, mm -hmm. now phi is actually zero on shell. So setting phi to zero in the effective action doesn't take me off shell and doesn't allow me to compare the two theories. But if you if, if you just if if you believe though that <clears throat> integrating out states should be associated with an increase in entropy, then at that level the argument makes sense uh, even for for loop completions but if you if you want the you know really really uh, rigorous argument that I gave here you really need a three level completion I wanted one question if you generalize this to ADS yeah can you frame this in terms of quantum field theory observables on the boundary can you say for example that charged excitations have a have a, a q over m for char for charged excitations uh, is bounded yeah so um we've actually been thinking about how to generalize this to ads it's it's surprisingly non-trivial to even run through this argument in ads for a couple of reasons for one when you're in ads you have a pressure so all the thermodynamic identities change and number two uh if you have some tree level completion and you're in ads remember phi on shell wants to go like the curvature Right? So phi ends up not vanishing at infinity on shell in ADS, where, whereas it does in this case. So that poses some problems in terms of formulating the ensemble that you're that you're setting up, with, mm -hmm. that you're setting this up with. You want you want the boundary values to be the same. So instead of setting phi to zero, you'd really be setting phi to like a constant <coughs> interval, which would change the effective Newton's constant. The, but but that, that gives you a flavor of what some of the non-trivial issues with going to ADS. But we think it should be doable. This square root of three over two. Yeah, I had not heard about that before. So yeah. what 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 happens at that point? So yeah, so there's a <coughs> sort of hand wavy way we can yeah. we, you can think of it. Um, gravitating systems uh, in the wild tend to have negative heat capacities, yes. famously, right? Um, but you know, thermodynamic systems in the lab, like a gas of photons, tend to have positive heat capacities. So what's going on at the at the turnover point for the charged black hole is that you know beyond uh, above q over m equals root three over two, the black hole is behaving more like a gas of photons. Its entropy is dominated by the entropy in, in the sense of, of of the photon gas rather than the, the rather than the gravitational part. That that's a way to think of it. Whereas whereas the short shield black hole of course has negative heat capacity. So right, but operationally, if but, I want to right. know sign of the specific heat. Yeah. So I would say if I add some mass, mm -hmm. does the temperature go up or down? Right. Right. If it goes up, it's a normal object. If its temperature goes down, it's the negative specific heat. That's right. So now the claim is if Q over n is greater than root 3 over 2 and I drop some mass into this object, mm -hmm. it will actually get hotter. That's right, because its, it's temperature goes to zero when it's extremal. Right. Yeah. But will this be true even if I drop a charged mass? Is this only true for uncharged mass? This is only true for, this is the uncharged heat capacity. Uncharged heat capacity. Yeah, yeah, okay. this is, oh, okay. right, right, this is Thank for you. fixed charge varying mass, yeah. I see, okay, but then if you wanted to include charged masses, there will be something else. Right, yeah, yeah, that, that would be a different term. Okay, good, quality. then now I'm happy with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, with that said, let's thank the speaker again. Today, Greg for Boston, visiting us
everybody for the invitation. Um, and if anyone from outside the glass would like to come in, there's plenty of seats. <laughs> Just notice you, it feels like we're in a bit of a zoo or something. <laughs> okay. But it's okay if you're shy. Um, right, so today I'm going to talk about actually more observational work. Uh, I'm trying to get at what the orientation is of black holes in systems called microquasars. Uh, one of those I'm showing you here, uh, and uh, what a microquasar is, if you're not familiar, it's a stellar mass black hole. Maybe. The laser doesn't work, huh? It works, just not there. It's not there, okay. Anyway, so there's stellar mass black hole at the center of the accretion disk. Uh, that disk is being fed by a binary companion star that's in some evolved state, and uh, those sort of systems are known as black hole X-ray binaries. Thank you. Uh, because black hole X-ray emission is coming from the innermost regions of the disk. You're in a binary system with another star, black hole X-ray binary. And when they produce jets, we call them microquasars. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, these systems, we think, are small-scale analogs of quasars. And for the purposes of this talk, a quasar is uh, an accreting supermassive black hole that produces jets. And here's one example called Hercules A. And uh, in some cases, these highly collimated jets can reach out to megaparsec scales, which is like, it's huge, right? These jets are among the largest structures in the universe. Uh, uh, and uh, incredibly powerful and have major implications for galaxy evolution and growth and things like this. Uh, but on the left, we're looking at a microquasar. So time uh, is going down this way. So over the course of about a month, uh, two jets uh, were emitted from where this plus sign is. and these jets from microquasars get out to be about a parsec or so in, in scale. Um, and this case is GRS 1915 plus 105, um, the first microquasar ever discovered. Now, the thing that microquasars have in common with quasars, one of, them, one of the things anyways, is that they're, these jets are both powered by disk accreting black holes. Okay? Uh, now, those black holes are very different in mass. Uh, in the case of microquasars, <laughs> typical black hole mass is about 10 solar masses or so, whereas in quasars, or active galactic nuclei, a quasar is a class of active galactic nucleus, um, the, the black holes can reach anywhere from a few million to up to ten, about 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And, uh, down in there is an accretion disk um, around the black hole. All right, so they both have black holes, they both have jets, and their variability may be similar as well. Uh, the, the difficulty is variability scales as black hole mass. And, and so for the active black nuclei and the quasars, Variability is very, very slow, and uh, with the exception of uh, what are called changing look AGN, which are recently discovered um, uh, class of active galactic nuclei that go through, uh, that, that seem to change their state, um, their spectral state, uh, with the exception of these exceedingly rare class of objects, when you look at a quasar, it's not going to change over your lifetime. Whereas a microquasar changes on humanly accessible timescales. So these are attractive systems to study if we're ever going to try to understand uh, how, how quasars work. Okay. And so what I'm showing you here, what this diagram is, it's something called a hardness intensity diagram. And you can think of it really as like an HR diagram or a color magnitude diagram for black holes. Okay. So 
down here on the bottom, on the x-axis, is color, and on the y-axis is intensity. And these black hole x-ray binaries go through cycles. They traverse the diagram like this. Okay? And just to give you a sense uh, of where the system likes to spend its time on this diagram, because I'm going to be showing you this diagram a few times in this talk, uh, I put together a fun little what's called data sonification. So I've converted this into sound, and I'm going to play that for you. Uh, and let me just show you what I'm going to do here. Down here, I'm going to keep track of days. All right. So every single point on this diagram is an observation made with the uh, Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer. And uh, I think, oh gosh, I think 10 days pass by every second or so. So I'm going to keep track of days gone by right there. Uh, Volume is mapped to intensity, so the louder something is, the brighter the source is. And you see, uh, just to give you an idea, this difference is about a factor of 100. So the source will brighten by about a factor of 100. And high notes, or high pitch, is on the left, means a softer spectrum, uh, which is lower energy emission dominates the spectrum. And lower notes will be uh, correspond to, to a harder spectrum. All right, here we go. We shoot up here real fast. Spend most of the time over here. Very Irish. <laughs> uh, RXT came back a little later. Right. And we decay pretty fast. So this whole cycle took about a year, all right? Months to year is typical of these sort of systems. Uh, and for some microquasars or black hole X-ray binaries, we can observe multiple cycles like this. So this is totally accessible from uh, an observational standpoint. OK. Uh, now, where do we see jets in this diagram? Well, we see two types of jets in these systems. We see these steady jets. Uh, whenever the source lies here on the diagram, we see these steady jets like this. They're not moving terribly fast. And then in these uh, horizontal branches of this diagram here and here, we tend to see these episodic relativistic jets approaching near light speed. And, and this is really when we deem a source a microquasar. Uh, when we see these relativistic jets from a system. But as you saw in the sonification, the system spends very little time here and here. And you have to get very lucky uh, to, to catch these jets in action right when they're launched. And that's very hard to do. And then the rest of the time, the source is here, where it spends the majority of its time. And we don't see jets in that case. Uh, instead, we see a very strong accretion disk, X-ray emission from the accretion disk, uh, and also uh, a wind <coughs> being blown off of the disk, but no jets. Now, so that's what we have to work with with these, these uh, black hole X-ray binary systems. Quickly, Greg, can I ask yeah. a question? Is the, that fraction of the time of the hysteresis cycle comparable to the number of microquasars out of the number of X-ray binaries? So if you have 10 X-ray binaries and there's one microquasar, does it spend one-tenth of its time in the green portion? Uh, so usually when we discover these systems, right, you discover them in outburst. So when they're quiescent and uh, very, very X-ray faint, we often don't even see them at all. And then when they traverse one of these cycles, we, we almost always see radio emission, uh, which indicates jets up right. here. Okay. But yeah. trying to actually like get at exactly when that jet is launched, for instance, is very hard to do. Um, and that's really the challenge. So getting like good constraints on properties of the jets, specifically like the inclination of the jet, which is done with kinematic modeling of that radio emission, uh, that's really hard to do. And that's, I suppose, what I meant to say. Does that answer your question? Sure, yeah. I was curious for the analog to ADM, but we can just talk to later. Yeah, I think, I think for the most part, they, they, jets are very common when they go into outbursts. We see that. We see the jet emission regularly. Okay. 
All right. Um, so kind of conventional theory has two prediction or predicts that the black hole spin axis is aligned with uh, two other axes in these systems. One being the jet axis. So it's thought that um, somehow some magnetic field gets kind of coiled up uh, along the axis of the jet. And if you're able to measure the inclination of that jet axis, you've effectively measured the uh, inclination of the black hole spin vector. But as I was just saying, that's very hard to do because, in, in fact, it, I mean, it all depends on your ability to catch the very start of that um, jet launch. And then you just look at proper motions of these uh, ejecta, uh, proper motion of this radio emission, and you can, you know, you know the time between two successive ejections, and, and you can begin to model the geometry of this jet. Uh, but you need very good observations for that. It's difficult to do. So just to be clear, are you saying it's possible for the black hole to be spinning like this, shoot out the jet, and then they bend? Uh, so you're, you're fooled into thinking that's the spin? And... Sure. So depending on what uh, the kind of intervening material is in the vicinity of the black hole, you could uh, that could cause the jet to divert. Um, but uh, I guess I'm talking much, much closer to, to the black hole, not, not at very, very large distances. Um, the other prediction is that the inner disk regions should align to the black hole spin axis. Um, and so this is a simulation where the black hole spin axis is pointing up like this initially, where it's always up like this. And uh, we are feeding misaligned material to the black hole. And through the Bardeen Pedersen effect, over time, the, uh, the angular momenta of the inner material aligns to the angular momentum of the black hole. And the closer you are, the faster that time scale is. So we think that the inner regions of accretion disks should align to the black hole spin. All right. So because jet observations are difficult, perhaps we can use the disk, the inner disk regions, which is where all of the x-ray emission that we observe is coming from. Maybe we can use those, that um, data to uh, probe the black hole spin. Okay. So if we're going to use the accretion disk, let's uh, again go through this diagram and, and discuss uh, what you know what what the data actually look like um, and and when this accretion disk component is dominant. So. Uh, let me explain exactly what I'm showing with this hardness here. What you do, you take a hard band in the spectrum, so 5 to 10 keV, and you divide that by the emission that you observe in the soft band. Okay? And that ratio is called the hardness ratio. And if it's large, the spectrum is hard, dominated by this higher energy emission. If it's low, the spectrum is soft dominated by this softer component. Okay, So when we go through this outburst <coughs> rise and traverse the diagram like this, the spectrum softens like this. And at the end, we see a whopping disk component. This thermal component here is due to an accretion disk. Um, extending down very, very close to the black hole. Okay? Uh, but we almost always have some additional high energy tail here that we also have to model. Okay? So there's still this non-thermal emission present as well. Um, okay? During the outburst decay, this disk component goes away. And we go back to a hard spectrum. So if we're going to use the disk uh, as a probe of, of the black hole spin, we want to do that when the source is up, up here. Okay? And ideally, we want uh, to have a very clean disk spectrum 
with no contamination from a high energy component, because it's just difficult to model uh, a power law plus a disk, because there's some ambiguity as to where that power law turns <coughs> over. And really, um, what you're observing is just sort of the peak of the disk emission. And, and so you're just modeling this wean tail, that's what you're fitting, but then you, you also have this power law that might be stealing some of that flux. So it's a difficult, um, it, it's difficult to model spectra that, that have significant high energy component. Okay. So with that introduction, uh, I'm gonna talk about a project I've done that demonstrates uh, alignment between the inner disk regions and the jet in the microquasar GRO J1655-40. Okay. This source is interesting because it's, it's one of only three microquasars, to my knowledge, that have uh, constraints on the jet inclination and the binary orbital inclination. And uh, in this case, that jet axis, which may trace the black hole spin axis, is misaligned to the binary orbital axis by 15 degrees. There's another system that's misaligned by 55 degrees, and there's another system that's close to alignment. And those are the three we've got. Um, and uh, the question is, can we model the inner disk and, and try to see what the inclination of that inner disk is? Because we think that should also trace the black hole spin vector. Okay. Now, the way we model the disk continuum um, is, is we have a model for, for the radial temperature profile of the disk. So at each radius, we assume that the disk emits as a black body with the local <coughs> temperature there. And we just sum up uh, the successive black bodies from each annulus, and we build up the disk spectrum like this. Okay? And so this is the disk continuum. And you see it's fairly featureless, right? All you've got to work with, really, is an energy translation left to right and an amplitude up and down. So what that means is your discontinuum model is really only going to be able con to constrain two free parameters, um, just owing to its featureless nature. Okay, and uh, I went through loads of archival observations of this system and found five successive observations made with SWIFT, where um, the, the, the spectrum is described incredibly well by just a pure disk, uh, and accounting for uh, absorption along the line of sight, of course. So just an absorbed disk model fits the spectrum incredibly well, and there's no need for a high energy component. Um, and so in this case, the two free parameters I'm talking about in this uh, phenomenological disk model uh, are a characteristic inner temperature of the disk and some normalization factor uh, describing the disk flux. Okay. All right, so that's great. So this success motivates uh, adopting a more physical disk model where we can specify all the parameters individually now, rather than just having those two free parameters. And it turns out we have independent constraints on some of these parameters, like the distance and the black hole mass. Uh, and, and these are what I call static parameters of the system. They're not changing on observational timescales. The black hole spin is also a static parameter. And the inner disk inclination, is, we, we think, is probably a static parameter as well. Uh, the dynamic parameters of the model our mass accretion rate, and something called a color correction factor. And what this does, this parameterizes uh, effects of the disk atmosphere. So as uh, the disk spectrum propagates through the atmosphere, uh, effects due to electron scattering and absorptive and emissive opacities will alter the spectrum that you observe, and sort of the zeroth order effect of the disk atmosphere is to harden <coughs> the spectrum uh, like this. So you shift the spectrum a little bit to the right, and that's parameterized by the color correction factor. And in principle, it's a dynamic parameter, right? Because uh, properties of the disk atmosphere can potentially change over time. Okay. 
And so we can take sort of the standard approach to applying this physical or this more physical disk model to, to these data. And uh, that's using a chi-squared approach, where uh, we sort of fix a parameter and allow other parameters to vary. And you may run into this trouble of being stuck in a local minimum of your parameter space. But um, w when, when we do two different uh, experiments here, where we say, let's choose the inner disk inclination to be aligned to the binary orbital inclination, which we know is 69 degrees. Or let's choose the inner disk inclination to be aligned to the jet inclination, which we know is 85 degrees. Okay? In both cases, we're going to fix the mass to what we know it is, fix the distance to what we know it is, and we pick some kind of fiducial value for, for this color correction factor. The result that we get uh, is the fit is incredibly well. Uh, when this reduced chi-squared is close to 1, that, in, that means that the fit is very good. Um, but we get incredibly different results for the black hole spin. Right? So the black hole spin that we measure from this technique is very sensitive to the inclination that we choose. Okay? But it's difficult to know which one is correct with this approach. Right? So what we can do instead is uh, take a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, where we uh, search for a global minimum in parameter space. And so what I've done, uh, same thing. Let's impose a prior for the inner disk inclination of 69 degrees, which is the orbital inclination, or 85 degrees, which is the jet inclination. Right? And then let's impose a, uh, just a flat prior, uniform prior, non-informative. When we do this, there is a very strong preference for uh, the disk to be aligned with the jet. Right? So this is uh, a nice demonstration that uh, these sorts of data can tell you something about the inner disk inclination. When, when you take uh, an MCMC approach to your uh, X-ray analysis. And in these three cases, what black hole spins do you measure? Well, if we set the inner disk inclination to be the orbital inclination, that requires I, essentially a retrograde black hole spin, a parameter <coughs> below zero. If instead we uh, align the, the disk with the jet, then we get a pretty moderate value for the black hole spin parameter somewhere in the range of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, with large uncertainty range. Okay. This approach also reveals parameter degeneracies. Uh, so here I'm showing you um, uh, this 2D posterior between the color correction factor and the black hole spin parameter, and we see a very skewed um, uh, kind of shape here, right? And, and uh, that indicates a strong parameter degeneracy. And again, just uh, from what I showed you earlier, the color correction factor really just shifts the spectrum left or right like this. And uh, the black hole spin has a similar effect, because what you're doing when you're measuring the black hole spin, you're actually measuring the location of the inner disk radius. And it turns out that's a the, that the black hole spin is a monotonic function of the inner disk radius. So if you're able to measure the inner disk radius, you've effectively measured the black hole spin under the assumption <laughs> that the disk goes all the way down to the innermost stable circular orbit. Um, and so if the disk can creep closer and closer and closer to the black hole, you're going to get more and more and more X-ray emission, and that will uh, give you more and more black bodies at higher energy. And so you know, it's not surprising that the color correction factor and the black hole spin are degenerate with each other in this way. Yeah. So I'm just a bit confused, so maybe I'm sure. wrong. I just, I just try to understand what is that jet angle 
to take off if you have a misal misalignment of the back hosting with the orbit orbital angular momentum, you should have some kind of rapid dash array. So that jet angle is actually varying over time, isn't it? So how can it be a fixed value here? Or maybe I'm just maybe the precision is not so big or so if you are feeding misaligned gas to a black hole, that will persist. Yeah. The black hole spin vector, uh, does that answer your question? Do you mean the spin of the black hole will process around the orbital angular momentum? Yeah. Exactly. On a time scale that's usually many orbits, so what's the orbital time of this? System? Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. It's, so uh, so uh, the orbital time uh, of, of the, you mean the, the, um, the binary orbital period? Yeah. I think it's about 60 hours, something like that. The, the, I guess the question is how many precessing orbit you are going to experience, or how, what is the period of the precessing, um, the, the, the precession, so that we know that whether it's possible to vary a lot within your emission time. Um, I don't, I'd have to work that out. Alright, um, right, and so the, la the last thing I want to say is, is uh, that this, this all has implications for, for measuring black hole spin magnitudes. So uh, really nailing down what the uh, inclination is of, of the disk is important, um, and, and here's why. So, so we, we've got um, two well-established techniques for measuring black hole spin. Uh, one appeals to the disk continuum, like I just talked about, and uh, the results for those spin measurements are on the y-axis here. And the other technique for measuring black hole spin appeals to uh, a modeling the broad red wing of an iron emission line. Um, and these are two different techniques. They both assume that the uh, disk extends down to the innermost stable circular orbit. And there are six systems, all X-ray binaries, for which uh, both techniques have measured a spin. And for the three near maximal spin cases, um, we find agreement. But for the three systems uh, here, there's disagreement between these two techniques. And, and you know, that warrants an investigation into both techniques and the assumptions that go behind <clears throat> both techniques to try to see what's going on. Um, in uh, this particular technique, what's usually done is uh, one assumes that the uh, binary orbital inclination is aligned with the black hole spin vector, uh, but at least in the case of GRO J1655-40, uh, I, I, I think uh, that, that may be a, uh, maybe not the greatest assumption. Um, and this is important to straighten all this out if we're going to use uh, predictions for supermassive black hole spin distributions um, to infer things about the cosmic evolution of galaxies and, and mergers and things like this because only the iron line technique can be used to measure supermassive black hole spins. Um, and so we, we need to make sure that both probes of black hole spin are in agreement before making any uh, conclusions about supermassive black hole spins. Yes. Can you just quickly explain what chaotic means? Sure, yeah. Preparing? So, so um, you, if, you're, if you imagine growing a black hole, uh, you could have what's called coherent accretion, where you're just adding angular momentum in the same sense. Uh, so like disk accretion onto a black hole is coherent, whereas chaotic accretion is just, just all... So that's why you end up at low spin. That's right. It, you tend to, you know, you get some gas with angular momentum coming this way, some gas with angular momentum coming the other way. Um, and those two different scenarios predict different spin distributions. And do, do, we, do we know observationally what kind of scenario? Well, so most of the iron line spin measurements are all very, very high. Um, so but, but there could be issues with those measurements too. It's, okay. I think 
we're still not sure. Yeah. Um, so the message I want to leave you with is just that theory predicts black hole spin axis should align with the jet axis, um, but these observations are hard to come by. We also expect the black hole spin axis to align with the inner disk rotational axis, and uh, I've talked today about how that might be accessible with uh, disk modeling, specifically using informative priors in a Monte Car Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, uh, which led to uh, this evidence of disk jet alignment in the microquasar Giro J1655, and um, the ability to constrain the inner disk inclination using this discontinuum fitting approach, uh, I think, has implications for black hole spin measurements. So, thank you. So the color correction, I guess you can narrow down from further modeling, right? Of the, I was just curious what modeling you put in, because it depends on, I think as you said, electron scattering versus absorption coefficients, and yeah. presumably you would get one of those from a accretion disk model, but you know, there's uncertainties in the model, so how, how, what do you do right now to, to yeah. narrow down? So, so I, I haven't done anything. I've allowed the color correction factor to, I, I've adopted a uniform prior on it, but what's done in practice um, is actually they do incredibly sophisticated modeling of the disk atmosphere. Um, uh, under certain assumptions, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, uh, but they include, uh, they include scattering, bound-free, free-free um, opacities. Um, and what, what they tend to find is, and, and they actually they do really a careful job of this, they, they couple that to um, their disk model uh, and are able to, from observation to observation, choose what color correction factor works best for the data based on this disk atmospheric modeling. And generally, that gives you a color <coughs> correction factor between like 1.5 and 1.7. Um, but that's all sort of just like vanilla disk atmosphere. It's possible uh, that magnetic pressure support in the disk would change that quite substantially. Um, and I'm happy to get into that if people are interested in hearing about it, but... Any more questions? I have a question. Why wasn't a uh, higher sound uh, associated to hard state in your uh, beautiful visualization? Uh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a natural choice, so I wonder did it. Well, maybe I should switch to wavelength or something. Is yeah. that what you're asking? <laughs> yeah. Head of energy? Yeah. It was uh, a very fun uh, demonstration. Thank you. Very jazzy. Very jazzy. <laughs> Right, so let's thank the speaker again.